Let's talk about politics, and environmental science, global warming, constitutional rights, social and economic challenges, money, power, choice. Nature does not compromise. Free droughts, free heat waves. Sea levels are rising, and it is about climate change. This is the uh, future of the next generation. Hello and welcome, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk About Climate, a podcast where we talk about climate change and how it relates to all of us. Join us, the Change of Chamber Fellows, as we talk with scientists, grassroots campaigners, politicians, and more as we open up the discussion on climate. I'm your host, Will Felix, and I'm along with my co-host, Erica Piechok, and we're joined by our special guests, Tom Pelton and Darren Crew. Tom Pelton is the Director of Communications at the Environmental Integrity Project. He's a Georgetown University graduate and a Baltimore resident. He has been reporting on environmental issues in Baltimore for over 20 years, including writing for the Baltimore Sun, Baltimore Sun, where he was twice named one of the best environmental reporters in America by the Society of American uh, of Environmental Journalists. We are also um, links to CTC's website and social media pages will be in the description below, as well as any links our guests speak about today. Today, we'll be discussing Baltimore water quality, and this is Let's Talk About Climate. Baltimore is a 62% Black port city on the coast of Maryland. It is the most populous city in Maryland and the home to more than 200 neighborhoods in a city famous for its historical landmarks, excellent seafood, and tourist attractions. Its history stretches back to the 1700s, with redlining creating a cycle impacting public works, housing, and planning the city that has been detrimental to the city's majority Black population. Some of the most dangerous effects come from dangerous sewage backups and dated sewage systems. Baltimore stormwater management is over-reliant on short-sighted, ineffective solutions. The sewage system was built in the 1920s and frequently mixes with the city's water due to the proximity of the different pipes and has only worsened with the increased rainfall from climate change. In 2018, Baltimore had over 17 million gallons of sewage overflows and 25 billion gallons of stormwater runoff, making stormwater runoff one of the fastest growing sources of pollution. Why do you think the city has not been able to come up with a reliable stormwater management plan, especially regarding the sewage system that has caused millions of gallons of overflow into Baltimore's waters and homes? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the city more than tripled its water and sewer rates to raise a lot of money to fix its antiquated and broken down sewer system that, as you mentioned, every time it rains, a lot of the sewer pipes are so poorly maintained, they have cracks in them, the rainwater gets right into the sewage pipes, and then it overflows both into the inner harbor, but also into the basements of, of hundreds of local residents, especially poor residents on the west side of mostly African-American neighborhood. Uh, just hundreds of people regularly have raw human waste coming up into their basements, coming up into their homes. It's a health hazard, and it's often caused by not only the city's negligence in terms of maintaining its pipes, but also when it started repairing its pipes, like I said, it tripled its water and sewer rates to fix its infrastructure. But in that process, it did it wrong. It shut down all the sewage outfall pipes into a local river called the Jones Falls before it increased the capacity of the system. And so then there were backups that were occurring because there were closed off outfalls. There were like pressure relief valves that were closed. And so people have been suffering a lot of just real health hazards in their homes. Um, and they'll complain to the city, I need some help, I need you to clean up my home. And the city has been rejecting more than 90% of these people's complaints for help and money to fix up their homes after the sewage overflows. It's a really kind of brutal um, system that's caused by neglect of urban infrastructure and some mismanagement by the city itself. Uh, the federal government, uh, something like 25 years ago, actually sued Baltimore and imposed a consent decree that gave the Balt City a deadline that it could not allow any more sewage to go pouring into the inner, inner harbor after a date, it was something about like eight years ago. The city did not meet that deadline and the raw sewage continued even though they raised lots of money, even from me, you know, I, I saw my water and sewer rates triple. Uh, and so it's been a real um, mismanagement um, and neglect, I think, have caused this real, it's really a public health crisis here in Baltimore. Uh, and building off of what you just said, um, the moisture from these sewage backups, as we just discussed, is, you know, it, it is a public health concern. It can cause mold, fungi, other harmful microorganisms to grow in these people's homes. 
Um, there's also significant property damage uh, that's created by these overflowing sewage systems and poor rainwater management. Um, and since entering into the consent decree that we just discussed about, um, the city's efforts have also been acute, or the city, yeah, of um, actually causing more sewage backups. Um, and the poor water quality also negatively impacts the commercial and recreational fisheries that are so vital and, uh, you know, really make Baltimore famous for its seafood. So what are some other factors that are contributing to Baltimore's poor water quality, especially in uh, lower income neighborhoods? And also, how does this poor water quality and water management affect Baltimore's residents and economy? Yeah, I mean, a whole other factor besides the neglect of the infrastructure that we've already talked about is the fact that we're seeing a lot more rain uh, in the mid-Atlantic region and the Baltimore region because of climate change. Significantly higher rainfall means that a lot of our urban streams are um, overflowing their banks, uh, tearing up their banks, bringing a lot more sediment uh, and garbage down into the inner harbor. Um, we also have a lot of problem, you know, as I mentioned, when there's more rain, there are more sewage overflows because the, the rain gets through the uh, broken sewer pipes and that causes the sewer pipes to, to overflow. Uh, and so on top of the urban neglect, um, we do have a problem where climate change is dramatically increasing the amount of rain we see, which means streets get flooded. Um, and interestingly, I mean, the Inner Harbor itself, which is, you know, a beloved part of, of Baltimore, people love to go down to the Inner Harbor to go shopping or eating. Um, because of climate change, the water levels are frequently now up and over the um, docks up and over the pathways where people walk uh, near the Maryland Science Center. Um, and um, when there are storms frequently, just the, 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 the it's called the Patapsco River, uh, will just start coming up into people's homes in, in, in uh, Fells Point um, and elsewhere in the city. And that's a whole other factor beyond the neglect of the pipes is the fact that climate change really is having a dramatic impact both on rainfall, on storm surges uh, coming up the bay, um, and on water levels uh, in the harbor and in the Patapsco River. So it, it's kind of one-two punch. We have both uh, neglect of the urban infrastructure and a lot more rainfall and, and higher water levels. Your organizations are doing amazing work to improve water quality in Baltimore. Um, Tom, your organization is advocating for Baltimore every day and tackling corporations that are polluting the waters. Um, I know in 2016, you all helped halt the construction of what would be the America, North America's largest trash burning incinerator in South Baltimore. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about these efforts and continuing efforts that your organization and the city of Baltimore has been working on to improve managing water and overall water quality? Yeah, um, our attorneys helped a neighborhood group uh, in far South Baltimore in the Curtis Bay neighborhood defeat, uh, it was going to be the, called the Energy Answers Incinerator. Basically, it's a big trash burning incinerator, pretty close to a high school uh, in, in far south Baltimore. Uh, and the high school kids were outraged by it. It was a project that was supported by the mayor, uh, by the governor, all the, the whole political establishment of Baltimore supported building this giant trash incinerator in this lower income neighborhood. But like the high school kids were like, no, no, we, we don't want to have this like near our playground. And so they began protesting and our attorneys, especially attorney Leah Kelly with the Environmental Integrity Project did a great job of attacking it from a legal perspective, challenging the permit, questioning the permit, uh, questioning it when it, when it was expired. Uh, and uh, simultaneously, the local residents, they did the lion's share of the work. They, they lobbied City Hall and they lobbied the school districts and uh, really, um, they led the effort, but we helped them uh, as kind of uh, attorneys uh, to, to help kill this gigantic trash burning plant in South Baltimore. So, so that is one thing that, that we did uh, and, and we're proud of hel helping with. Um, we also, uh, you know, our director, Eric Schaefer, used to be the director of enforcement at EPA. And he was the one who signed something like 25 years ago, uh, a consent decree with the city of Baltimore to try to force the city to stop dumping sewage uh, into the inner harbor and stop allowing sewage overflows. And we are still keeping on top of that issue 
uh, we, we monitor the sewage overflows in the city. Um, we, we push and we advocate for better control of that sewage. And also we've been trying to help local residents get better compensation when their homes are flooded with sewage to try to get the city to actually pay them back. You know, in white suburban neighborhoods, if there are sewage overflows that happen there, it's amazing how quickly the county government will rush in with county funded rescue teams to clean things up with hazmat suits and fix the problem and clean it up immediately. In the city of Baltimore, that does not happen. Most African-American residents, their houses are, are, sued, uh, are flooded. And the city's attitude is, hey, it's on you. You pay for it, you clean it up. 90% of the time, it does not pay them back. So that's a real uh, discrepancy that, that we're concerned about and been pushing with our allies at Blue Water Baltimore and Clean Water Action to try to solve that problem. Have you seen any efforts from the Baltimore city and government to bridge any of these gaps or um, have they really been lacking in that management? I'm going to say the city has really fallen down on the job and, and even has been, I'm going to say, contemptuous of, of local residents. Um, unlike in the suburbs, uh, when people's homes are flooded with sewage from the county sewage pipes and, and, and teams are sent by the county government to, to, to fix it up. In Baltimore, the government has taken a very skeptical view uh, and saying, well, I've heard them say in public meetings, these people, they flush all kinds of things down their toilets. They're basically saying they, you know, I've seen them trying to flush, you know, rugs down their toilets. And it just, it's a very like contemptuous view. And they try to disqualify all claims for sewage cleanup funds. Um, and they say they do it because, oh, we're trying to protect the taxpayers' funds. I, I don't see that same kind of skepticism out in the suburbs. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a real kind of um, negative view of city residents. Uh, and instead of giving them the benefit of the doubt, um, just giving them a hard time when they're just trying to clean up sewage in their basement. I think that flows perfectly into our, our next uh, conversation topic. And um, I'm just going to throw some numbers out there to get back up exactly what you just said. So um, Baltimore currently does offer financial aid for its residents who suffer from sewage overflows. Um, in 2018, there are approximately 4,600 sewage backups. Only 74 households applied for reimbursement. 10 were approved. So the Department of Public Works is working with a $2 million budget, paid out $15,000 of that budget. That constitutes less than 1% of that budget. Um, also- And that, that was money, by the way, that was set aside specifically to help families with the sewage problem. Exactly. Uh, it, so it, it, that was money for that purpose, but they only gave out a tiny percentage. Yeah, great point, great point. Um, it, I mean, that is mind blowing. And- um, same year in 2018, Baltimore launched a pilot expedited reimbursement program to help residents with the cost of cleaning up sewage, as we were just discussing. Similar to those numbers, in the first three years, only 120 requests for reimbursement were filed um, that were thought to be about 18,700 reported cases of sewage backups and 120 requests out of that. Um, and then 19 were approved. So we're talking massive discrepancies here. Um, I think we just discussed why Baltimore's aid is not reaching the number of residents. Um, if there's any other top, um, any other things you want to touch on about that, but really, yeah, I mean, I, I just want to mention uh, on that same point. A lot of it is the city again is putting the onus on the local residents to know about the program, know that it exists, to reach out to the city within a specific time period, and if the resident doesn't apply for the funds within a specific time period, they're disqualified automatically. Again. That is the opposite of in the counties, where the counties will literally send out to the residents' homes teams to clean things up immediately and pay for it all. So it's um, assuming the residents know about this relief program, putting it on them to apply for it, giving them a very tight timeline to apply for it, and then skeptically viewing the applications that come in. So it's, it's a real, again, almost like a uh, blaming the victims mentality. Yeah, no, it's... That's really nice. That is said is a good way of saying it, blaming the victim mentality. And um, secondly, uh, moreover, what changes need to be made aside from, you know, I guess, letting everybody know, spreading the word, raising awareness about this program uh, for Baltimore's resources to be used more effectively? I think, to be honest with you, I'm going to be real 
blunt about this. America has its priorities wrong. There is no reason that we should be giving giant tax breaks to Amazon and other big corporations um, and neglecting our urban infrastructure. It is wrong, I think, for a country to be allowing the super rich to be paying no taxes. And yet we have grossly neglected our water and sewer systems. Baltimore City is a poor city. And uh, a lot of what's needed here is money to, to fix the pipes, uh, to, to better reimburse people. And um, we need to have more federal investments in our cities uh, and in our infrastructure. Uh, and, it's, and the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure bill is, is not enough. A lot of it is going through existing channels that still neglect urban areas. Um, and so part of it is that we, as a nation, we need to start spending more of our time and effort um, building up our public infrastructure, our, our public roads, our public bridges, our public parks, our public schools, um, and fixing our water and sewer systems. Now, on top of that, we need to be honest also. Baltimore City has a dysfunctional government. There, there is a political problem where there's mismanagement in the Department of Public Works and in the city government. Um, and that also has to be fixed. Uh, so we, we need better um, project management. We, we need, need better supervision. We need more transparency. What are they doing with the money? How are they spending it? Um, and so, you know, we need both a kind of a carrot and a stick in a sense. We, we do need more investment. Uh, and at the same time, we need uh, less dysfunctional government and more efficient government at the city level. Yeah, and to get um, more into the science behind what exactly is happening in the waters, um, for Blue Water Baltimore, they do um, uh, quality water reports, um, and they found that the water quality has declined over decades. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, they increased rainfall and stormwater runoff is a big reason for this. Um, bacteria, nitrogen, and chlorophyll levels have all gotten worse in the past decade. Um, of the four bodies of water in Baltimore studied by Blue Water Baltimore, all of them decreased in water quality between 2013 and 2019, and a lot of them remain too polluted to support recreation today. Um, in another study, bacteria scores in 20 of 27 stations were worse in 2021 than they were in the previous year. This study saw the worst chlorophyll and phosphorus levels ever recorded at most of the tidal stations. A lot of the algae is more abundant in these areas, mostly due to the untreated sewage, malfunctioning wastewater treatment plants, stormwater runoff, pet waste fertilizers, everything we've touched on. However, water uh, clarity, drinking water quality, and phosphorus levels are all showing hope for Baltimore. Billions of dollars, as you've mentioned, are being invested into new infrastructure for plumbing systems and drinking water is quite healthy in Baltimore. What do you think are the most important changes Baltimore's government needs to make to make clean water accessible for all of its residents in these bodies of water and get the pollution out so that residents are able to use them? And what do you think Baltimore has learned or should have learned over the last decade? And what does it still have to learn for the needed changes to be made? You know, it's interesting. A lot of people have this stereotype of Baltimore, uh, as Donald Trump might say, that it's a hellhole. You know, that it's just a, a filthy, godforsaken, murder-ridden, uh, the wire uh, landscape. The, the truth of the matter is that Baltimore is a beautiful city. And interestingly, we have a lot of waterways that are pristine and excellent. I'll give you an example. Uh, Liberty Reservoir is owned by the city of Baltimore. It's one of our drinking water reservoirs out in Baltimore County. I was out there fishing on Saturday. Um, if you get a little permit for your uh, kayak, you can go out fishing. It's like you're fishing out in the wilds of Wyoming. It's, it, there's no development around the reservoir. The waters are crystal clear. It's, I caught 13 fish on Saturday. Just absolutely beautiful. Um, we also have a thing on the Pretty Boy Reservoir, which is farther north, Baltimore County. Again, pristine, beautiful waterway. But guess what? Both of those beautiful waterways are really inaccessible uh, by people who have means. So I have a car and I know how to get a permit 
and I'm rich enough that I own a kayak. I'm not rich, but I, but I have a kayak. So I can go and enjoy this absolutely world-class, beautiful Baltimore city waterway. Um, but the actual average resident of Baltimore has no clue that it exists, has no access to it. So that's a real problem where we do have some beautiful natural resources here in Baltimore. But usually it's only the rich and the connected who know how to use them. And the people in the city um, of lesser means, you know, where do they go? Well, they go to the local park and there's often raw sewage uh, flowing through their urban stream. You know, my kids grew up here in the city and we have raw sewage in our stream, in our neighborhood all the time. Or they go down to Love, go down to Inner Harbor. It's a real sense, so, source of pride and joy. Um, but all too often, there are sewage overflows. You can smell it in the Inner Harbor. There's trash floating in the Inner Harbor. Although sometimes the city does net that up, good for them, but there's still an awful lot of uh, uh, sewage overflows. And so one thing we need to do is kind of bridge that racial gap, that uh, income gap, and help the city expand access to our natural resources to people in the inner city who don't have access to them. And we need to clean up our urban streams and our urban parks and our inner harbor, because this is the waterfront that a lot of people live right nearby. And it's their only waterfront. It's the only place they can go in the summer. People still crab on the Baltimore waterfront. They, they, they'll, they'll throw their chicken necks on a string into the Baltimore Harbor and they'll pull out crabs and they'll eat them. That's not necessarily good uh, because there's a lot of pollution in the harbor, but people do crab and eat out of the harbor. Um, and we need to clean it up. We need to focus on uh, fixing the sewage pipes. That's been going on for a while. The city has made some improvements at our uh, Back River Wastewater Treatment Plant. And there is a, a new kind of uh, pumping station that the city has built out there that, that is helping. That they have made some improvements there to reduce sewage overflows into their inner harbor. So, you know, I think a lot of it has to be with focusing on helping city residents find and use the beautiful, pristine natural resources that Baltimore also owns. And focusing on improving and fixing our urban infrastructure so that our parks and waterfronts are beautiful and usable for everyone. You've mentioned this kind of gap in um, education and knowledge of the clean, clean waters that Baltimore does have in the reimbursement programs, these sorts of things. How yeah. can Baltimore kind of bridge that gap and allow its citizens to use these more effectively and know about these programs? I think, number one, on the sewage reimbursement program, they need to change the emphasis. They, they need to stop putting the onus on residents to file for reimbursements. Uh, and they should, when the city gets a report, if someone calls, oh, there's a sewage backup, the city should send out people or send out contractors and just pay for the cleanup. Just, just pay them. Um, that's what they're doing in the counties. Why can't we do it in the city? So th that whole program needs to change and to put the onus and the responsibility and the action as a reflexive thing on the city or contractors that they hire for, for sewage cleanup. You know, in, in terms of fixing up uh, other parts of, of the city, um, I think that, you know, the city needs to have better project management for its infrastructure repair programs. Uh, I think, it, you know, we need better leadership even from our mayor uh, to make sure that the infrastructure is a top priority and to, to fix and repair these long neglected systems. Lastly, uh, we at Change Chamber, our website's in the description below, so I encourage our audience to please go check out our website, click through, learn more about our programs, missions. Um, please go check us out. Um, we love to empower the youth to be more involved in solving our climate crisis um, and improving our environmental quality. We really try and um, inspire people to become environmental change makers. Um, what can the youth in and outside of Baltimore do to support a positive change in water quality in Baltimore? I would say volunteer for our friends at Blue Water Baltimore. Um, they're a wonderful organization and they do terrific work. Um, I think it's also important to speak out to your elected leaders. Um, in Baltimore City, we had high school students become the activists who passed a ban on styrofoam cups and, and styrofoam um, packaging. Uh, and so 
it was high school students who, who rose up and said, you know what, we're sick of having all the styrofoam in our streams and our parks. So they basically um, showed up at City Hall and they petitioned uh, and they got lots of signatures and they got the city of Baltimore to pass a ban on styrofoam cups and styrofoam containers. And that then inspired other cities and other municipalities to do the same thing. So that was a great example of how local Baltimore residents, as, as students, can voice their opinions on environmental issues at the city level uh, and at the state level to elected officials and uh, make real change. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure to get to know you and hear about the mismanagement and neglect from the city, but also solutions that you all are working towards. Um, and to wrap up this episode, we'd like to give our guests about 60 seconds to just pitch or share anything that you're working on, what you're excited about, or anything that you'd like to share. So the floor is yours. Sure, well, you can visit our website at the Environmental Integrity Project, www.environmentalintegrity.org. And you can see that we're involved in basically trying to hold polluters accountable across the United States. Uh, we sue major polluters, whether it's BP or Exxon Mobil, uh, we are a watchdog to make sure that the EPA follows the laws that it's supposed to follow, like the Clean Water Act. Um, and we also empower communities in Baltimore, in Houston, uh, in Pennsylvania, all over the country. If they need lawyers or analysts to challenge some big, like an oil refinery being built or expanded or uh sewage overflows uh, in the local community. We have uh, attorneys and analysts, uh, and I'm a journalist. We write reports to kind of shine a spotlight on projects. So check us out, www.environmentalintegrity.org, and um, we'd be happy to have your, your input. I'm your host, Erica Ketchok, along with co-host Will Felix, and we are joined by our special guest, Darren Crew, the Director of Restoration at Blue Water Baltimore where he manages restoration and engagement project planning to slow down runoff and filter out pollution. He has been with Blue Water Baltimore for over a decade reporting on environmental issues and emphasizing the importance of natural improvements to water quality, such as planting trees and rain garden projects. Links to CTC's website and social media pages will be in the description below, as well as any links our guest speaker talks about today. Today we will be discussing Blue Water um, Baltimore and Baltimore water quality. And this is Let's Talk About Climate. Welcome, Darren. So Baltimore is a 62% black port city on the coast of Maryland. It's the most populous city within Maryland, and it's home to over uh, more than 200 neighborhoods. The city is famous for its historical landmarks, excellent seafood, wonderful tourist attractions. It's got a dated history back to the 1700s, uh, with redlining creating a cycle impacting public works, housing, and planning in the city. It's been very detrimental to the city's majority black population with some of the most uh, dangerous effects coming from dangerous sewage backups in a dated sewage system. Baltimore stormwater management is also over-reliant on short-sighted ineffective solutions. The sewage system was built in the 1920s and frequently mixes with the city's water due to the close proximities of all the different pipes. And it is only worsened due to the increased rainfall that we're seeing because of climate change. In 2018, Baltimore had over 17 million gallons of sewage uh, overflows and 25 billion gallons of stormwater runoff. That's shocking. Um, making the stormwater runoff one of the fastest growing sources of pollution. So the question is, why do you think the city has not been able to come up with a reliable stormwater management plan, especially regarding the sewage system that has caused millions of gallons of overflow into Baltimore's waters and homes? Well, uh, thanks, Eric and Will, for having me on your Let's Talk About Climate podcast. It's an honor. I'm really excited to talk to folks about stormwater and sewage and our watersheds in Baltimore. So watershed is the first concept. So in Baltimore City, our watersheds extend into the county. So we have Gwynn's Falls, Jones Falls, Herring Run all go into Baltimore County. Um, Herring Run drains to Back River and then the Chesapeake Bay. But the Patapsco is the largest watershed that drains into the middle branch. And it also has Montgomery County, Anne Arundel, um, Carroll County, and Howard County. So water flows downhill, watersheds are all connected. So one of the challenges has been um, controlling upstream flows and, and uh, all the impervious surfaces. So it's, it's multi-pronged. We've got, um, we need more green infrastructure. So we need folks planting rain gardens, 
by our retentions in their small yards. We need our county partners, government partners doing that as well. And they're ones that can do stream restoration. They can do these big, bigger bioretention projects. Um, and they, in Baltimore County, for example, they have a ton of stormwater ponds. They've been retrofitting them. And that actually deals with the flow. They've had these dry detention ponds to get geeky. And those did less to address um, water quality, but more volume. And so they're trying to do a lot of retrofits on that. Um, we also need to stop adding more impervious surface to our watersheds. The city is kind of like built out, you know, like Baltimore City, as you talked about our beautiful history, we have great crabs, great neighborhoods, and we used to have a million people in the city alone. We're down to below 600,000. So we have all these row homes and we also have beautiful um, quarter acre, half acre lots as you kind of get out. Um, but that black butterflies, the red line neighborhoods that were uh, red line and they have a lot of more under resourced black and brown neighborhoods, great people, great neighborhoods, but they have a lot of vacant homes, which the city and state has been tearing down. And so that's really helping. Um, so it's really, it's it's complex, right? So then now let's talk about the infrastructure. That's something that our governments can control. So we've got all the pipes, we've got drinking water, stormwater, and sewage pipes. Um, the city and county both got sued the late 90s, early zeros um, because of their lack of cleanup and sewage. And so they both have Baltimore City and County both have a sewer consent decree, and they've been working on that, but they both missed their deadlines. So it's not surprising in Baltimore City because we, we're really under-resourced from a tax base, but still our waterways, we need clean water. We need folks that don't have the ability to go to a pool to cool off in the summer to be able to take it. That's what I did. I grew up in Pennsylvania. I would play in streams and not get sick. Whereas in Baltimore City, you have a higher chance. You jump in the harbor after those rainstorms that we were talking about before we got on the podcast two nights before, good chance of getting an ear infection or tummy bug, and nobody wants to be on the toilet afterwards. So, but they're doing, making good work, right? So they have the mandate to clean up wet weather flows, the city and the county from our sewer system. That consent decree, we've intervened as a legal entity to try and pressure them and get more good things done and get them to do this more rapidly. But those broken old storm drain pipes that are leading into the sewer system are overwhelming it, and it's just taking a lot of time. Um, however, we could be doing more stormwater maintenance. Um, so like you had the CSX train line collapse re a few years back. That was a big issue. We've had um, in Baltimore County on Cromwell Valley Road near Cromwell Park, there was another infrastructure issue where that road was shut down due to those pipes being broken. So really, it's a time and resource issue. Um, that our government partners have been working on, it's just been taking a lot longer. Um, and so with the sewer water combining with the stormwater every time it rains, they've been a, it's, it depends. Some watersheds, they've done really good progress and they've fixed a lot of them, but others are just behind. Um, so it's going to take a combination of our government partners fixing those sewer lines. And then the, the one thing that the consent decree focuses less on is these dry weather issues. And so their next step will be focusing on when you have a pipe that's cross-connected, eliminating that. Um, and so we're really looking forward to them finishing their consent degrees and that'll really help with water quality. It'll be a lot more swimmable in our streams um, when it hasn't rained. And then when it rains, the stormwater is still a major issue. We have high watersheds with high impervious surface, 30 to 40% impervious. So um, especially the, the main ones that go into the harbor, the Jones Falls, Winds Falls. I have to follow up on that. Um, I know that the city is a billion dollars behind in deferred basic maintenance of its public buildings and facilities, and over half of which received failing grades um, from an internal office of general services report last year. Is funding the issue in Baltimore, or are there underlying conditions that is just not allowing this funding to come through? That's a question I wish I knew the answer to. <laughs> As a government employee, I'm not. Um, I can just say procurement in Baltimore City is slow, which means that if you have budget approval for projects and our systems are not as functioning as well as the county per se, we get behind easily. So in Baltimore City, we've noticed that. We've seen different projects and we've been the recipient of contracts and grants where it really just takes a lot more time. So even Erica, when you have the funds in place and you don't have good systems, that delays and you get, and so it's a shame because then the city then gets fined because if they're behind on the sewer consent decree, then MDE is able to find them. And so it's kind of a vicious cycle. Yeah. I think that's a great question for the director of public works. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, to talk more about these sewage backups, they, they can impact the health of everybody in Baltimore with yep. mold, fungi, other harmful microorganisms. Um, they create a huge public health concern. There's also significant property damage that comes with the overflow of the sewage system and poor rainwater management. Since entering into the consent decree with the fe- consent decree with the federal government in 2002, the city's efforts have also been accused of negatively impacting um, sewage backups, creating more of them, and um, negatively impacting commercial and recreational fisheries that make Baltimore famous for its seafood. Um, what other factors are contributing to Baltimore's poor water quality, especially in lower income neighborhoods? And how does this poor water quality and water management affect Baltimore's residents and economy? Yeah, so I'll first focus on the problems that are contributing. Um, so we have certain neighborhoods, a lot of the red lines neighborhoods have really low tree canopy and high impervious surface. So back in the day, those a lot of those neighborhoods were built to be feeders for industrial companies. So you like had people coming in, these were um, factory workers, small houses, a lot of pavement and paved backyards. Um, we also have uh, high impervious surface, which we talked about as well. Um, so those two combined, if you think of like how we slow down runoff and filter it, you need spongy things like rain gardens, trees, and you need no pavement. So the challenge is we have a lot of pavement streets, driveways, sidewalks in Baltimore City that are locking us in. Then you have the disinvestment of Baltimore where you had white flight in the city and people left from the 60s to now. And there's lots of other people leaving too at the same time. So we've lost our tax base. Those aren't excuses, but those are facts. We have lost money. And what has happened because of that is you've got that disinvestment, then you have that compounding problem with lack of resources and tax base coming in. So our storm drains in the city, they're getting flooded often. We have different council people. We have known areas where they need to fix the storm drain because it's a capacity issue. And your podcast, Climate Change, has changed the intensity of the flood so that the total volume from our old engineering calculations has changed. And so you've got like, dude, it's crazy. That storm two nights ago, uh, eight feet in Herring Run at Sinclair Lane rose eight feet. And then in Gwynn's Falls, it rose 10 feet or 12. And that volume of water based on, I mean, the Baltimore City was developed in the zeros of 1900s, right? All the way up to the 1960s. So you have old engineering calculations based on old storms that aren't in including this. So your storm drains are going to get overwhelmed and stuff's going to back up and flood. Um, And so that we talked about the disinvestment of infrastructure over time, but then there's still a lot of opportunities too. So we have a lot of opportunities to turn those rights into wrong. Baltimore city actually grew its tree canopy, which I'll talk about more from 2012 to 2018. We added 81 acres. We're the one of the few cities in the nation that actually increased urban tree canopy, which is pretty awesome. Um, so those are so you think of crisis equals opportunity. There's still a lot of a good opportunity. Um, there's also a big issue with vacant housing in Baltimore, and there's groups like Rebuild Metro and the Build Coalition, Baltimore United in Leadership Development, who's focusing on how we can solve that. And they have some kind of model ideas. And there's so many vacant buildings that that can be a great solution to improving neighborhoods improving stormwater runoff and climate resiliency. So there's really some great opportunities too. So Darren, uh, your organization, Blue Water Baltimore, is doing amazing work to improve water quality in Baltimore by building a clean water movement. Kind of just spoke a little bit about that uh, in the region and conducting vital research. Um, Can you tell us some more information about any current projects that you may have not just discussed um, and or movements that are occurring in Baltimore and within your organization to better manage and improve overall quality? Yeah, definitely. Um, One of the big things that we're doing is we're trying to make um, the implementation and installation of green stormwater practices, the rain gardens, bioretentions easier by helping to streamline permitting. So we're working on that with the city. Um, The county has been really supportive of our green stormwater projects and been working collaboratively with the Department of Environmental Protection and Sustainability. You know, like with all partners, there's all good and bad. There's no like most of us are trying to improve and, and make a win for the environment. So that's been great. Um, the one thing that the Maryland General Assembly passed, which is really exciting. So because of the Baltimore owns our storm, our st- the water lines and the water um, reservoirs, we also own most of the infrastructure and responsible for both the drinking water and sewer lines. That said, we talked about how the disinvestment, population loss, tech base, uh, Maryland General Assembly passed a uh, rule to set up a task force 
um, which is looked at looking at doing a new model for managing our regional water and wastewater systems. This could be really revolutionary, exciting, innovative, all those cool buzzwords and really help the Chesapeake Bay, our neighborhoods. And so we're really excited because it's 2 million people that are served across the six jurisdictions, which I talked about earlier, with Baltimore City and County, Anne Arundel County, Howard County, Montgomery and Carroll. And if this task force comes up with great recommendations for a better resource system, that could really be game changing because we know the county has better procurement policies, the city has all the infrastructure, as long as it's equitable to Baltimore City, because our investment is huge, we're the first ones to do all this. It really could be a win-win for our neighborhood streams, rivers, quality of life, and uh, that's really exciting. Um, and then as an organization, we do we do monitoring. So we have a website called Baltimore Water Watch, where you can see the bacteria levels and the water quality change. We have, um, um, we have a waterkeeper boat. We're out there suing folks. So we have a number of active lawsuits. We also just ask polluters if they're polluting to clean it up first. We ask nicely, and then hopefully they change the ways. And then sometimes we have to use the big stick. That's our, that's Alice's job as our waterkeeper. But we do the fun things too, like the things that make a difference more for just than just water quality. So we plant trees to help neighborhoods for economic revitalization, to look beautiful, to have shade, um, and to have pride in their neighborhood. And we get volunteers out to do um, fun exploration things in our streams. We get them out to do bug hunts, uh, you name it. And then we operate Herring our nursery, which is a native plant nursery. Um, so I think we're one of the more diverse watershed groups that are out there that does a lot of we have a social enterprise, we do monitoring, we do restoration, or as a lot of groups focus on one or the other. Um, so it's exciting. Yeah, and we'll put, um, I've got a couple of links we'll post. So if folks want to get involved and volunteer in Baltimore, we'd love to have you. They're a lot of fun. And uh, all links, as we will keep saying, will be in the description below. So please uh, do go in and click through those links and, and learn more, please. Um, so next question, uh, Baltimore currently offers financial aid for its residents who suffer from sewage overflows of 4,600 4, sewage backups. Only 74 households applied for reimbursement in 2018 and only 10 were approved. The Department of Public Works is not strapped for money as less than $15,000 of the $2 million budget for reimbursement has been paid out, constituting less than 1%. The same year, Baltimore launched a pilot expedited reimbursement program to help residents with the costs yeah. of cleaning up sewage back up in their homes. And in the first three years, only 120 requests for reimbursement were filed, and of those, only 19 were approved. During those three years, the city received more than 18,700 reported related um, sewage backups. Um, why is Baltimore's aid not reaching the number of residents it could be helping, and what changes need to be made for that aid to reach its residents? Yeah, that's this is an issue that really hits home because it literally backs up in your home. When the shit hits the fan in your house, that's where the connection between watershed issues in your home, it becomes very relevant. And what has happened is it's actually, it's affected those who've been, who have less resources. So it's even, a, it's worse. It's happened in public housing and it's happened in neighborhoods with lower income. And these are the most vulnerable folks. So this is where we're most upset and angry about the way this program has gone and we help to intervene to make it better. So yeah, Baltimore City, initially it just wasn't outreached well and promoted well. So folks didn't know. And then it was a little clunky. So on the homeowner side, when they had a backup in their home, they had to prove that it wasn't not a dry weather issue because it was only set for when the stormwater and the sewage water mixed together. So if you if you had a backup and it could have been due to a grease ball down the system or an, a capacity issue of the system. So it literally could not have been your fault that the shit at the fan, but you weren't able to get reimbursed. And we thought that was unequitable and not fair to our residents. Um, so we tried to strengthen it. So we, and we asked them to change it. So now they're looking at, um, we asked them to change it to do a direct assistant instead of only reimbursement. So that's one thing we've asked. And the city launched the program several years ago. And then the other thing is that we've been meeting on the consent decree with EPA and MDE and we've, and they've asked the city, they've ordered them to do um, to expand their scope of the program to, to reimburse people with any backup that's caused in part or in full by the main line, rain or shine, which means you no longer have to have, say that it's rained before. So it could be a dry weather event and they're going to reimburse you, which is great news. So that's going to open the program up to thousands of more people. Just like you said, they had all these, we've talked about the systems of the city not being great. 
we talked about how many complaints they got and how few were reimbursed. This should really open it up to more residents who are having these problems where it is legitimately the system and not their own practices in their home. And so hopefully we're excited that it'll expedite it. So if folks in Baltimore City or County are watching this and they do have a backup, call 311 right away and report it. And then you can also use our pollution reporting hotline to report that as well. Um, but you should be, the 311 operator should tell you about the new program and how to apply for it. And then I would also advocate you just contact your council person as well, because they'll be the one to help advocate for you. Yeah, so we're really excited about the new um, guidance and recommend or really order that MDE and EPA is going to give the city because it'll really help more residents and speed up um, what is really an, a demoralizing situation and turn it at least to get them compensated quickly and speed up what is a really embarrassing um, event in their life. So um, according to Blue Water Baltimore, the water quality in Baltimore has declined over the last decade, some of which can be attributed to the increase in rainfall and stormwater runoff. Bacteria, nitrogen, chlorophyll levels have all gotten worse throughout the last nine years of recording. Of the four bodies of water in Baltimore studied by Blue Water Baltimore, all of them decreased in water quality between 2013 and 2019 and remained too polluted to so uh, support recreation. That's really upsetting. Uh, in another study, bacteria scores in 20 out of 27 stations were worse in 2021 than in 2020. Uh, this study saw that the worst chlorophyll and phosphorus levels ever recorded at most of their tidal stations. So this means that algae is going to be more abundant in those areas, uh, mostly due to the untreated sewage, malfunctioning wastewater treatment plants, urban stormwater runoff, pet waste, fertilizers, all of the things we've been talking about throughout this podcast. Um, however, water clarity, drinking water quality, and phosphorus levels are showing hope for Baltimore. Um, billions of dollars are being invested into new infrastructure for plumbing systems, and drinking water is quite healthy in Baltimore, which is great. Mm -hmm. Let's celebrate that. Uh, what do you think are the most important changes uh, Baltimore's government needs to make for clean water to be accessible for all of its residents? which is really important, all of its residents. Yes. And uh, what do you think Baltimore has learned over the last decade? And what does it still have to learn in order for uh, the needed changes to be made? Yeah, it's a great question. I will drink some of Baltimore City water because it's delicious. <laughs> when I go visit my uh, mother up in Pennsylvania, she asks us to bring the water. It really does. It tastes really good. Because So our watersheds are up in the county and they're surrounded by woods. So we've got Lock, um, Lock Raven, Pretty Boy, and um and they're just and so we have great water it's kind of like new york city um yeah so clean water for all it's interesting because down in the harbor you have a lot of um marinas and boat owners and folks that have they're living in high rises and more upscale um housing so more upper income upper income folks and they're surrounded by a waterway which at times is unswimmable and undrinkable because of the bacteria contaminates. And then you wouldn't want to swim in it anyways after it rains because of all the other mix of um, oil and grease that runs off in all the dirt. So the big thing that would help us out is like we talked about before, finishing the consent decree and continuing to eliminate those sewer overflows and that allow for public access, public health. Um, and the sooner we can get that done, the sooner we're going to eliminate a lot of those dry weather events that are happening and also reduce um, those storm related or wet weather overflows. We can't, help. so climate change is like the long-term play too, because as we cut emissions, I believe we can do this. It's going to take a lot of hard work, but I believe America and the beautiful humans on the earth can do it. Um, but as those, I mean, I think it's, you're looking at a century to see improvements of that. That's my, um, that's my prediction. I don't know. That's my thought. Um, those will also help with storms coming back to more of a normalcy. Um, I do think there's a lot of opportunity, like we talked about with the vacant homes and revitalization of Baltimore, of creating more green spaces, both for work and play, and also to improve the waterways, um, to grow food and things like that. Um, there could be a huge green roofs initiative across the city. It's really going to take, though, these bigger policy initiatives combined with us making behavior change. So there's an opportunity for folks in Baltimore to plant trees in their yards. The biggest opportunity to reach our tree canopy goal in the city um, is through planting and private property. Um, but because of the, like Baltimore City is locked into our pervious surface to a certain extent. I don't know how much, maybe you can reduce it 30%, maybe, I don't know. You're kind of fixed, right? So you have to be creative in that way. Um, I, I have these big like thoughts, like I use the bathroom in my yard. I take peas in my yard. 
But if you think of the idea of taking this delicious Baltimore water and doing number one or two in it, it's kind of weird, right? For, for public health, it makes sense. But if we think of this, we just clean the water and then we're going to dirty it. I'm curious if in the next 50 years, there's more creative thoughts to the waste system, which would then eliminate us shitting in our rivers and streams. It's obviously treated, it's not like it, but sometimes in Baltimore, it's like that. So that could be really cool. I think the task force recommendations for the Baltimore City um, regional water system could be re really revolutionary to help us to see clean waterways. Even like stuff that Blue Water Baltimore does in Waterfront Partnership about talking about when it's safe to swim and not swim is helpful because you can, there are times where it's safe to recreate in our waterways. But the challenge is we just, there's just so many unknowns with the broken system. Is it going to be always safe? And then how can I interact with my waterway? Because you want to balance the fear with the reality. Um, so for example, I went out rock fishing in the Inner Harbor uh, last Sunday. I caught a keeper. I took it home. I ate it. Um, it was a dry weather event. Rock fish are migratory, so I don't have to worry about contaminants. Um, but I fish in the harbor, and I'll occasionally take the right fish home to eat. So if that's the case, folks could fish on certain days. You could also use hand sanitizer. So those are the kinds of things we're looking at. But I mean, I think it's a really exciting time um, with the awareness on climate change and our waterways and the space opportunities in Baltimore City to really do something big as we um, grow, as the city starts to grow again. Lastly, we at Change the Chamber, uh, link in the description, or you can find us at changethechamber.org love to empower youth to become involved in solving our climate crisis and improving our environmental quality. What can the youth in and outside of Baltimore do to support a positive change in water quality in Baltimore? Yeah, youth need to be, they are future leaders of the world and they really need to advocate for what they believe is right and just for them. So they need to be allies for those who are experiencing injustice, our Native Americans, our black and brown communities, and then they need to fight for and advocate for clean water for climate change solutions. And if they run for office or talk to their politicians or organize protests or just demonstrations or tree plantings, all of that helps because it raises awareness. They need to be, they're our leaders. I have two children, a freshman in high school and a sixth grader, and it's really about them. We plant trees for the next generation. Um, if, they, if they talk, people will listen. And the louder they are, they, the more they influence old people, which, I'm becoming a little bit, but your generation and the future generations can really make a difference. And human potential is very high if we think about it, if we focus on the right things. There are a lot of things that we could solve if we focused our energy on the things that really were most important. Yeah, well, well said. Um, and once again, thank you for joining us and thank you, Erica, for hosting. Uh, it was a pleasure to get to know you and to hear about uh, Blue Water Baltimore and uh, water quality issues in Baltimore. Um, to wrap up every episode, we really like to give our guests, you know, 60 seconds just to pitch anything that you're working on, excited about, or anything that you just want to share. So Darren, the floor is yours once again. Well, thanks again for having me on the Let's Talk About Climate podcast. Erica and Will is great. You guys are super organized and the future is bright. Um, yeah, I would say just we need to like call out what the problems that there are and advocate for solutions. Look for policy solutions. Look for ways you can be most effective. Um, and lead by example. And if we all lead by example, um, it takes a, a village to raise children. It takes a planet to keep the planet alive. And we're all part of the planet. So let's do our best. Let's do it. We can do it. Yeah, we can. We can. So uh, thank you so much, Darren Crew, for joining us today. And to our listeners, thank you uh, for listening to another episode of Let's Talk About Climate. Uh, remember, before you go, don't forget to like us, subscribe, rate, share, You know, give us five stars on all of your podcasting platforms. It really helps. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at Let's Talk Climate Pod and Twitter at Talk Climate Pod or X. Uh, and check out our website, changeachamber.org. You can find all of the links that we talked about today that Darren mentioned. Everything will be linked in the description below. Um, again, thank you uh, for listening to us. Um, and with that being said, this was another episode of Let's Talk About Climate. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you for joining us.